This next presentation, I think, is, uh, is going to be one that you're going to love. He's the CEO and founder of Refine Labs, and he created a, a process that he calls the Demand Acceleration Framework. Not just capturing the existing demand, creating demand, and then accelerating that demand. I think this is going to be a great one. Put your hands together and welcome the CEO of Refine Labs, Mr. Chris Walker. Around 2017, I became obsessed with how people, how my buyers were actually buying things and how much different what they were doing versus what the executives and the people that worked in the companies that I worked for thought they were doing and thought about how they were buying. And I started to see this big divergence between what my customers were telling me, both verbally, through surveys, through their own behavior, um, and also just what the executive team was, t was going through. So one, one story, one example here is that I was in, uh, I was, we were selling into hospitals, ER, ICU type of hospitals, and I was in there at two in the morning doing some market research. At that point, I was more like a product marketer, field marketer than a demand marketer I've evolved. Um, and so at that point, everything's really quiet in the ICU, and so I started to look around at what people were doing, what were the physicians doing, what were the nurses doing. And they were all on their phone, and they were looking at Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. And then I started to think about how we could put content inside of those channels so that when they're there at two in the morning, instead of looking at some random YouTube video, they're looking at a video about a clinical trial that just came out about our product, or a case study about a customer that had success with our product, or different things like that. And so beginning in 2017, I went down this very different journey than what I think most B2B marketers are marketing towards. And so some of the things that I started to learn the first time I ever, and we changed the title of this talk last minute, so some people have create demand, some people have dark social. The first time I recognized what dark social actually was was in 2017 because I would run Facebook ads targeted at the exact accounts that we were going after. So in 2017, 18, before Cambridge Analytica, you could literally go into Facebook and you could type in, I want to run ads specifically to employees of Boston Children's Hospital or Seattle Children's Hospital or all those things before any ABM tech came around. Those were some of the things that we were doing. And when I would run the media at that point, I would get 100 comments from people that worked at the accounts that we were going after with the job titles that we were going after saying, hey, I don't understand this thing. Or could you give me more information about this? Or we don't like your product, we tried it, or we love your product, or all these different things. And then, as we started to do that, I recognized that none of this stuff was being tracked. All the software that we had, we had Salesforce, we had HubSpot, we had Enterprise Attribution, all this stuff. I was having hundreds of conversations with potential buyers, and none of it was being tracked in the CRM automatically. And so I've continued to kind of go down this road and have evolved in like what's actually going on here. And so. The major shifts that I'm seeing in the market right now is that one, buyers trust their peers more than anything else, more than the results that they get in Google, more than the advice they get from Gartner, more than the stuff they read on vendors' websites, they trust their peers. And over the past maybe th three to five years, but it's accelerated over the past 18 months, that these buyers now know how to access their peers to get that information in a way that they didn't know how to before. And so when you think about yourself as a B2B buyer compared to five years ago, you know that you communicate with, interact with online people that do your job way more now than you did five years ago. For me, it's every day. And for most people, it's every day on networks like uh, LinkedIn for marketers is a big one, but also podcasts, Facebook groups, Slack communities, uh, direct word of mouth, DM, Zoom calls, all these different places. And so now that B2B buyers can use these channels and they know how to get to their peers, that's where they're going to research, discover, and purchase products. They're spending their time listening to podcasts. They're spending their time inside of social channels. 
They're spending their time reviewing things in Slack with no intent to buy. We'll get into intent later because B2B marketers are obsessed with intent. So they have no intent to buy in these channels, but they're researching, setting business priorities and all these different things. And because companies can't track them in the way that they've normally tracked things with attribution software, most of the companies just don't do them. They don't do them or they just mail it in. You kind of get the, the company that posts on LinkedIn once a week with like a PR blog or something that gets no engagement except for the employees at the company like it because they share it in a Slack channel. And so companies are just not executing here. The reason being is because they spend all their time focused on capturing demand that already exists in channels that have intent. And the reason that they do that is because the attribution models inside of their companies almost force marketers to do it that way. And so the places where B2B companies, and just for a little bit of context here, my company, Refine Labs, we work with 40 enterprise SaaS organizations throughout North America, me and APAC, and I interact with hundreds of other companies, both in consulting, speaking, different things like that. The places where B2B companies spend their money digitally, paid search, typically 80%, 70, 80% of media budgets go to paid search, the reason being, Easiest to track, people are searching on Google on a desktop computer, direct response, super easy to track. Review sites like Captera or G2 or other things like that. Lead aggregators like Software Advice. And then the big thing that's emerging is intent data and the intent data gets created when people use those platforms too. And so what we have here is that marketers are waiting at these lower funnel channels, waiting for people to come in saying, hey, I've already decided that I, I know that this problem exists and I know that I wanna solve it and now I'm gonna try and figure out who, which company I'm going to use to solve it. And that's where mar every marketer waits. Buyers come in and then you have five to 20, who knows how big your category is, three, five, 20 companies that are all fighting over these buyers. The thing is, that when the buyers come through and they make that search, they have a preferred brand. Then usually the preferred brand is the company that educated them through the process to get them to that point. It's either that or it's all of the people that all of their peers told them which one to buy before they entered that space. And so, we have all up here this thing called dark social. It's how I've been able to grow my company from zero employees to 50, over 50 employees in the past two years with no funding. It's operating in these couple of channels. We create a podcast, we've built a community using live events, and we post content on LinkedIn every day. And the reason that other companies don't move, like I'm talking 100 million ARR SaaS company wouldn't move on those types of opportunities is because there's no attribution because a, a, a marketer wouldn't get credit. They wouldn't give it enough time to work. And so I see these type of like, these misalignments here between how buyers are actually buying and how companies are doing marketing and they're going in separate directions. And so the current state of the way that I see B2B marketing, and I'm just gonna call it how I see it here. I think that there's a complete over-reliance on technology, I think that, which has created a very systematic assembly line type of approach to sales and marketing that puts measurement first before customer needs, before customer understanding, before marketing fundamentals. And so when you actually, when you go out and adopt technology, and this is just what I see for B2B companies do, they adopt technology and then all of the limitations of those technologies then become part of their marketing strategy. They can only measure the things that the technology can measure. They can only deploy on channels with the te that the technology can measure. An easy example of that, I mentioned that I was running B B2B Facebook ads in 2017. We were spending $50,000 a month and driving $10 in, pipe in qualified pipeline for every dollar we spent there major, major, and we're winning those deals at 30, 30, 35%. So great return on ad spend in that methodology. And then I'm over here watching all of these, all of these marketers adopt ABM tech and run display ads and not get ROI. And so, the, and the reason is because they adopted the technology and then they did what the technology could do, which is measure certain things. And at that point, the technology was so immature, it couldn't run LinkedIn ads either. It was purely display. 
and I'm over here with no technology, running an ABM strategy targeting directly at accounts, in Facebook and Instagram, which was by far the most effective channel to do B2B marketing at that time, and it's still pretty close today if you think about from a page strategy. And so those are some of the things that I'm seeing inside of the, the landscape, over-reliance on technology. The next one is a, is, a, is a real lack of what I would call marketing fundamentals. And so when we think about, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where all the background is, maybe like hands up if, uh, hands up if you're in marketing for software. Okay, so not that many. So just, it's a good sample size here because most of the co accounts that I'm working at are tech or software. Um, and so some of the things that we're seeing there, lack of marketing fundamentals, like there's no people on the marketing team besides the product marketing team actually go out and talk to customers actually are in the market, actually are listening to what people are saying, which can then drive content strategy, can drive media strategy, can drive overall demand strategy. Um, and so because of these kind of like specializations and silos between whether you're a marketer, a field marketer, a product marketer, a demand gen marketer, or, or whatever, what I've always found and what I truly believe, and I think that's where, where I come from as a marketer, is the, the, when you're the best is when you know how to do all of them and you know how to mix them together, right? So I grew up in product marketing, and then I did a little bit of field marketing, and now I'm heavy demand and brand, but I use all the skills across the set. And so um, general lack of fundamentals is something that I'm seeing right now as well. When we think about actually creating demand, you need a completely different type of measurement model, you need a completely different type of mindset, and you use different channels. And so when I'm thinking about creating demand, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to educate and inform prospective buyers about the things about our category, the movement that's happening, and why they should prioritize it inside of their business to solve it. So there's not a ton, not a huge amount of product messaging. There's not a huge amount of like lead gen type of stuff. Um, and so it's purely educational. You can get that done through paid. You can get that done through organic. The ideal mix is obviously some form of both in order to teach people things that help them understand and set their priorities so that they move into intent channels to convert. When you're not doing that as a business, somebody else probably is. So let's go through the, let's go through the example of if you are not creating demand, which is what I would say most companies are doing right now. You're sitting down here waiting in intent channels for people to find you, spending most of your money on Google search. Somebody is out there teaching people what they need to know in order for them to consider using you. That could be a different vendor. That could be they're hearing stuff in word of mouth. That could be that they just happen to see the problem inside of their business and start to search and find something. Those are kind of the three things. But where you want to be as a company, and the most advantageous is how you win categories, how you accelerate growth, things like that, is take control over how many buyers are entering buying cycles at any, any type of point. And when you take control of that and you're the person that educates them, when they come through, the odds of them choosing you go through the roof. So you have more people that think that you are the category leader and more of those people are entering buying cycles and they're coming in and coming inbound to buy. And that's how you get like this accelerated growth motion. That's pretty much what we've done at my company. So we've been able to educate people on why creating demand is super important. We've been able to educate people on this idea of dark social and how all this stuff is happening and how attribution models are completely, stu completely stunting innovation inside of companies. Major enterprise organizations are missing major opportunities because their marketers can't market there. Um, general things like that. At a tactical level, what we've done over the past two and a half years is basically create a category and a narrative and then be able to put that out in specific channels on a consistent basis. And so the first one that we opened up was LinkedIn. This is 2019. Um, the opportunity on LinkedIn is still high. It's not as high as it was. It's declining every day, but it's, it's there, still very high. And I was posting content on LinkedIn, had zero, it was just me working there, we may have had one or two customers, and I was posting on LinkedIn every day. 
getting seven likes, 10 likes, 18 likes, things like that. But the people that were liking the posts were CMOs at companies that I wanted to work with, marketing managers, they're the people that I was going after. And so in that situation in a B2B company, someone would come up to me, CEO, actually I've had this happen to me before as an employee, someone would come up to me after about three weeks of doing this and say, where are all the leads, Chris? Stop, stop messing around with LinkedIn, we need leads. Go do that or you're fired. Um, luckily, I own my company, so I can call, I can call the shots here, but that's, that's what happens in most of these programs. You're gonna get one, two, three month window. They're not gonna see attribution, they're not gonna see immediate results, they're gonna shut it off. Um, and so I continued to work through that. In, it was August 9th, 2019. I posted something. Somebody that had a big following must have commented on it because my post got like 1,000, 100,000 views. I'd never had anything like that happen to me before. And on that day forward, I've been pot committed to LinkedIn for, for, for and I still do it. I still post on LinkedIn almost every day. And we've continued to iterate the strategy. And so I'll talk through on the strategy. One of the things that people get hung up on, and it's something that I got hung up on around this time on LinkedIn, is not knowing how to write something every day without it feeling repetitive and stale. And so I ran into that not too long, and then you get writer's block and you get stuck. So one of the things that we started to do was we would do events like this or set up our own events. So we set up, either it was live events, and then we moved to virtual with COVID, where I would basically just answer people's questions and talk about topics and record it. And I did that, I still do that every day. I did it last, or every week I did that last night, which creates about an hour long piece of content that then we can then chop up and I'm all in on video on LinkedIn. And so we are able to put, publish three minute video on LinkedIn, six minute video on LinkedIn or things like that. One of the nuances on video that I think that most people don't understand or really respect is that the copy of what you write in the post really matters. And so I can, cha I can change based on, I could take the same post, and I do this sometimes just for testing, I take the same post that I posted three months ago, and then I change the copy, and I see how much different it can perform. So the copy really matters, because in the, in the feed of LinkedIn, a lot of people aren't gonna stop and watch your six minute video if that's what you're doing. So being able to create the, the copy that someone can read so that they can engage with it, so that they can amplify it to their connection so that you get more exposure is something that's really interesting. Um, that, um, the video or the overall recording has be, uh, was put on a podcast. So I've been, we've, since COVID happened, we pivoted to a live event that was recorded that would go on to a podcast. The, and we've done 100 and I think 196 episodes of a podcast in the past 18 months. So it gives you a sense about the commitment level to this strategy. It's at this point now a top 25 marketing podcast in the world. Um, in the past three months, some of the largest B2B organizations in the world have come inbound to work with us because of the podcast execution. And so what I'm trying to help people understand here is one, there's some tactical things in there, but it's also about looking at marketing with a long-term view. I think that most B2B marketers, and just because of the nature of the companies that they work in, look at marketing at like a 30-day view. I have some people that are like, oh, our, our leads went down last week. What's going on? And it's like, there's normal fluctuations in demand and how things are working. Um, so having a long-term view of marketing that's years of time is where you get major lifts. Obviously, as a marketer, you need to be able to hit short-term targets, and we can answer questions and talk through the balance between being able to hit the short-term and build for the long-term. Um, but what we've been able to do is demonstrate that you can act long-term, you can act like you're building for the long-term, and also drive better short-term results than what most B2B companies do right now by just executing properly, truly understanding customers, and being in places where they actually are. And so the things that I see right now, and I'll go a little bit deeper into what companies do, is that when they go out and try and create demand, I find that they do it in places that people aren't paying attention. The major one right now is like ABM tech that gets transitioned into display ads. When was the last time someone in here clicked on a display ad? And it's really interesting here because the opportunity 
for people to even see a display ad is going way down. Here's why. Think about the, thing, the tools and the things that you use on the internet. You, I use SaaS tools, Salesforce, HubSpot, all those tools. No, there's no display ads or banner ads there. I use Slack and other desktop apps. No banner ads there. I use social networks, predominantly on my mobile device. No banner ads there. I spend a lot of time on other applications on my mobile device. No banner ads there. And then I occasionally go to Google and go to dictionary.com to like look at the thesaurus and see if I can find a synonym for something, and there's a display ad there. And in companies' entire account-based marketing strategies are built around that. So marketing in places where people actually are, my belief is that where people spend their time. Social networks, it's going to depend, it's going to be different on your buyer, but I think that the major ones right now are LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram, TikTok. The second piece is on content platforms. And I see these a little bit differently because there's less engagement. Content platforms, podcasts are huge. Podcasts are huge. YouTube is also a very interesting platform, especially now that they've introduced YouTube shorts into the mix, which is kind of like a TikTok place. There's some good things there. And that's where I see a lot of B2B buyers um, spending their time on the internet. And so then it's up to us as marketers to one, understand people deeply enough to be able to give them information that they actually want. I see um, most marketing, most marketers grew up at a time where SEO was at its prime. And so you kind of think about your content strategy from an SEO mindset. And when you try and move an SEO mindset content strategy into a podcast, into LinkedIn, into Facebook or Instagram, it doesn't work. And here's the reason why. The reason that this doesn't work is because in search, you have pure intent. People are looking, I want this information, and then you just give them the information. But when it's in a podcast, when it's on LinkedIn, other things like that, there is no intent. They're out there on the channel, and so in order to get them to engage and consume, you actually need to be delivering an enormous amount of value in a differentiated way that they can't get in other places. And so in order to win on social, you need a much different content strategy. You need much more expertise, in my view. And so I'm going to start to kind of close out here. I'm looking forward to some of the questions. But the way that I see marketing is going through a major divergence right now. We have marketers from the 2010 era that are obsessed with marketing automation, that are stuck in their attribution models, that are over relying on technology, that are getting further and further away from customers, that still consider their main job to be collecting contact information so their sales team can try to do sales to people that don't want to buy right now. That's 2011 marketing. And then there's 2021 marketing, which is that we're not going to be able to rely on the tech because it's incredibly limiting. We're going to be marketing in places where people actually are. We're going to be understanding them so deeply so that we can be basically a peer to them and provide pure expertise. And marketing's job in 2021 is to drive buying processes at scale with their buyers on their own with no sales touch, giving people information, which becomes the trigger to people going into these types of channels like LinkedIn, like Revenue Collective or a different type of Slack community and saying, hey, have you ever used that company, Refine Labs, before? And letting my own customers say, yeah, we have used them. They're awesome. And so when I think about my, quote, what people would think about top of funnel marketing strategy, most people are like thinking about blogs that are fluffy or things like that. What I'm thinking about is how do I put information here, which gets someone to go and ask my, their peers about my category, my company, the product that we're offering, things like that. And so when you think about creating demand, it really is, how do you use content to take advantage of word of mouth? I'll leave you with one other thing, which I think is really interesting, that I'm seeing a ton right now that I don't think that marketers truly understand, is that I'm posting content on LinkedIn every day, and I'm getting messages from VP level, CMO level, it doesn't really matter what level, managers, they're saying, I took your content, I went up to the top right, I clicked on it, I said, copy the link, 
And then I took that and I shared it in my company's marketing Slack channel. Or I shared it in my company's senior leadership Slack channel. And so by producing good content and putting it where places where people actually are, my target customers are taking that content and then doing the selling internally for me. So they're passing that information, they're getting people on board, none of that stuff's being measured. And so um, I'll kind of I'll kind of close out there. I, I just want people to understand. I, I interact with a ton of companies, and my belief is that the the over reliance on attribution is causing major major problems inside of companies and restricting them from taking advantage of these massive opportunities. Looking forward to answering some questions. Thank you. We got plenty of time, so people that want to talk tactically or have any things yeah, to go deeper. Yeah, yeah, why don't we do some questions? Uh, raise your hand if you have questions. Go ahead, man. Yeah, hey, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm glad to hear someone else thinks that ABM is mostly bullshit. Um, <laughs> uh, here's my question, though, right? Because, so I'm also in the enterprise SaaS business, and you know, our board talks to me every two weeks about what we're spending on marketing and how many leads it drove and what it drove in pipeline and all this good stuff. Do you have any thoughts for you know, how you could do any tracking or any metrics that comes out of this sort of stuff that is actionable? Or have you deployed any like strategies for asking people how did you hear about us? Or like, is there anything you've done to try to solve that attribution gap? Totally. Yeah. So you mentioned one of them on our forms. We have a how did you hear about us free text field required. And so we recommend that to our customers too. And then when you go and look through the data, so we have hundreds of submissions now, and you go and look through the data between what HubSpot attribution, and it does no knock on HubSpot, the same thing you get in Visible or other ones, what their attribution is telling us, what multi-touch attribution software that we have installed on top of it is telling us, versus what my customer is telling us, are completely different. And so what you're normally gonna get is you're going to get the lower funnel channel, so it's gonna be either, from attribution software, it's gonna be affiliate, it's going to be search, paid or organic, it's gonna be direct traffic. And then if you're gonna ask your customer, how did you hear about us, you're gonna get the real stuff. You're gonna get word of mouth, you're gonna get this podcast, you're gonna be, I heard about you in this Slack group, um, my you know, VC or PE firm recommended you. You're gonna get that type of stuff when you ask. And so I've recommended that people think about attribution in two ways, where you have you kind of like your capture demand attribution, which is everything that multi-touch attribution software does. And then you need to think about your create demand, which is gonna be in places that are difficult to measure, where you're gonna need way more qualitative data. So the how did you hear about us works really well. We've also um, executed and recommended two other things. So the, and these are kind of like, if you think about stepping up a ladder, how did you hear about us gonna get you pretty far. Next one would be, um, Win, win analysis, so accounts that close, calling the main point of contact on those deals and talking through them to understand their entire journey. So you might get, both, you get deeper insight than the how did you hear about us. Then the last one is large scale market research surveys to the market, which is basically trying to understand where do people spend their time, how do they wanna buy, how are they discovering our brand? And we do those for companies in like a six month interval after they work with us and like 80% of the market that says they've heard of our brand or like we heard about you from social media. Got it, thanks. Cool. Go ahead, man, yeah. Hey, thanks for that. Um, from a personnel perspective, as far as content creation goes, do you like to see it coming from one person like the, the way that you post on LinkedIn? Do you like to see it coming from, like is this something you want sales teams to be doing? How, how what do you like to see or what do you recommend to your clients? <sighs> Yeah, totally. So um, most people see me because I have the largest following. I've been doing it for the longest time, and honestly, I'm just the most consistent. But there's probably about 35 people that work at my company that post on LinkedIn at least weekly. And so I think at the beginning, my recommendation for companies, you kind of need, you need someone to pave the way. And I typically like that to be an executive person. So pave the way, demonstrate success, show people um, what good looks like, get, like, buy-in, create confidence and freedom, help enable people so that they can do it, and then you start to spread out people based on who they want to do it. One of the interesting things at my company, which I think is different than most companies, you asked about the sales resource, is that 
all of the people that post on LinkedIn for my company are not salespeople and they're not commission, they don't get commission or they're not incentivized to close deals, they're marketers. And so they're like, they're more like a subject matter expert or a peer to the people that we're trying to sell, the companies that we're trying to sell to than a salesperson. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how that plays, but like I believe that the most impact from a content standpoint comes from people that have expertise. And so if you're, if it was me, right, like my content wouldn't work for chief information security officers. My, my, I wouldn't be able to make content for a emergency medicine physician because I don't have expertise in those types of fields. And so when I've been in situations where we're marketing to those types of people, I need to either go out and find people that are external that can be our partners to help us create that content, or I'm trying to hire some of our best customers so they can work on my marketing team so that I can have someone to be the host of the podcast that can provide that level of expertise and things like that. So when it gets into the sales professionals com uh, component on LinkedIn, it's a different ball game if you're selling to sales and marketers than other people, but I think the number one thing for, for sales reps is to be visible there, to have a presence there. And so commenting on what your potential buyers are, are doing and saying, um, interacting and engaging, which creates visibility to the brand, hopefully like producing content that people want. So those are the, some of the recommendations on LinkedIn. Hey, Chris, hey. follow you on LinkedIn. Love nice. your videos, Thank your you. content. I've attended a couple of your events. Um, I have a question though regarding when it comes to getting into these communities and these groups, what, what would you recommend would be a good way to hire a person to do that? So for example, let's say I have um, a plethora of content mm -hmm. and I wanna distribute that content, but instead of doing the, the traditional like advertising channel, I wanna be able to have a team eventually be able to go into groups, have relationships in those communities, and somehow distribute that content in, in a, in a meaningful, meaningful way. And then I've got to figure out ways to measure it and kind of prove success. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have any, anybody who's doing that or you're aware of that. Yeah, so the, the way that I look at it is like a social platform, a content platform, and a group or community are three different things, right? And so like, when I'm in a Facebook group or a Slack community, it's typically not places where I'm publishing content. It's more like I'm watching what people are doing, I'm engaging at some level, I'm making some comments, like that's kind of what's going on there. And then I have my channels where I'm really like publishing content, which tend right at the moment are LinkedIn and a podcast, and then paid heavy Facebook and Instagram. And so those are kind of like the places where I'm going to put content. I'm not sure that I really got to your question though. So if you want to ask a follow-up so we can get deeper, that'd be great. No, I'm just, I'm just curious on, on um, let, let's say that I've, I've created like, you, you have, a, I have a presentation that's really good, really helpful in it. And it helps a particular, like my ideal customer. Um, what, I want to, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to have a team to where they can, uh, you know, be assigned to specific, say, Facebook groups mm -hmm. where those ideal customers hang out and then become a part of that group and then be able to just kind of pop in the, into the conversation say, hey, by the way, um, I know you guys are talking about this, but I've got, um, there's this cool like presentation that mm -hmm. I, you know, somebody on my team put together and then be able to drive traffic in that way, mm -hmm. but have like a systematic and, and system behind that. Yeah, so the, the recommendation here, I'm not sure if you're gonna like this recommendation, but the recommendation is for you to do it yourself first to see whether there's something there before you bring on a team of people so that you know, is it going to work? What are, how do people react when I comment this way? Some, some people are like, I, I don't want your deck, right? Who knows what they're gonna say? Um, so see how people react, see if it's actually driving a business impact, and then you truly know, what are the skills of the person that I need to hire yeah. in order for them to do this effectively? Do they need to have expertise? Do they need to understand social really deeply? Do they need to understand how to do tracking? It's probably some combination of all of them, but like when I go into new channels, just like I did on LinkedIn, like I'm in there basically, like I tried to break LinkedIn in 2019. I tried to figure out ways, I posted eight times a day, never heard anyone post that much, just to see what would happen. Really messed up the algorithm, by the way. It's not, re not recommended to post eight times a day, but posted eight times a day, tried a bunch of different times. A lot of people on LinkedIn at that time were like, oh, LinkedIn's a business platform. You don't wanna post on the weekends. 
And then I would go in on Saturday morning and for like six weeks in a row, I would write a post and I would know that it was gonna get more than a million views because no one else posted on Saturday and everyone was looking there. And so I was the only content that got shown. Um, and so being able to go in there and really like kind of learn the dynamics is something that I recommend for all leaders before they bring on a team, especially when you don't really know what's gonna happen. Okay, I appreciate it, thanks. thanks. Hey Chris, thanks for the presentation. Of Great course. content, yeah. Um, do you do anything other than the consistency of, of posting in those, um, you know, in the dark social uh, to incentivize um, or manage the word of mouth, or do you just leave it to chance? It's so weird. I don't. Uh, it's. It, I don't really consider it leaving it up to chance. Um, but the strategy is built with the core idea of if I create, if I understand the details of, this, of what's going on in these companies so well, and I create information that they could use on their own and get tremendous business value, then those things are going to be shared. And so and I have analyzed probably more than 100 B2B SaaS companies inside of their CRM. I know what the win rates are for LinkedIn lead gen. I know what the win rates are for this. I know how much customer acquisition cost is when they do this. And it's pretty consistent across each company. And so when I know all those details and then I create content about how companies waste so much money on paid search and they overspend by 5x because they don't know how to create demand, there's a lot of companies out there that know that they're overspending on Google, but they don't know what else to do. So they take that clip and they're going to go and share it with someone. Um, and so it's more so, it's not necessarily that I'm leaving it up to chance, but it's that I know that my understanding of the companies and my content strategy is so good that I don't need to incentivize it. Okay. So you're relying on um, your depth and breadth of knowledge as a subject matter expert that's just going to automatically generate that word of mouth. And it, gr yeah. and it scales. Yeah. So like in 2019, when I had 10,000 followers on LinkedIn, and now right now where I have 80,000 followers, like the amount of initial visibility, this is something that I didn't get into, but it's, it's something that I've been able to explain much better recently, is that you have initial distribution. So I have initial distribution on LinkedIn, and then we put it on a podcast. But then you get secondary earned distribution between peers after that. So somebody that sees the LinkedIn post then goes and shares it in a different mechanism in a different channel with somebody else. And then you could actually get tertiary distribution where like the, some of the people that were in the Slack channel that saw that then go into a meeting and talk verbally to someone about the content. And so you can see how if you put it in one place and you have initial awareness and you get the initial kind of like share that can spread in a way that's really interesting. And the number one thing is like the impact of somebody that sees my content on LinkedIn versus when the CMO takes it and then goes and gives it to the CEO, it's completely different. And so when somebody else shares my content, I think the impact is way higher. Way higher, yeah. So that's, um, you're getting that information anecdotally about how it gets shared and, oh, well, so you, you know it got shared such and such a place, you find out it went into this person's Slack account to, to whatever audience they have, mm -hmm. but you're getting all of that anecdotally. It's pure pure anecdotal. Okay. And so I know it's happening. I think like some of the things that I might have mentioned today, people might have never really thought about, right? Because I didn't really think about them until people started telling me that it was happening. I'm like, whoa, like all these companies are spending so much money trying to get people onto their website. And what I'm doing is I'm putting content here, and then people are taking the content and putting it into their Slack channel. What's more valuable? <laughs> Slack channel. And so I'm just there's like some nuances here, and the and because people can't track it, they don't see it, and they don't look hard enough to get the and they don't like two things. They don't look hard enough to get the anecdote. They don't execute well enough to, for that to happen anyway. All right. So the lack of ability to measure it reduces the value in their mind when in fact the value may be far greater than what they're measuring. 100 percent. Yeah, I'll go through a couple examples. What, um, what B2B companies measure all the time? How many people opened my email? How, what the, like, how many impressions of display ads the, that account got? Um, how many people filled out my like, ebook form? Those types of things. And the things that aren't being measured when somebody listens to my 120 minute podcast, CMO listens to that, not being measured, way more valuable. 
or somebody like the CEO sees my six minute video on LinkedIn, not being measured, way more valuable. Um, somebody hears me speak at this conference, like I'm not looking at the lead list of this conference, but maybe one of you heard something cool and then you go and tell somebody. And like, that's valuable, not being tracked either. And so there's this, um, a lot of people, like what I've been trying to, what I think about it is it's like the catch 22 of attribution. Like most companies think they need to measure everything and because they think that, they actually don't do most of the things that are right in front of them that are so obvious that could just be better for their customer and better for their company. Let's give them a really big hand. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Awesome job, man. All right. What's up, everyone? Closing out here at Traffic and Conversion Summit. Really cool trip. We're uh, finishing up the talk. We are going to a dinner. We're meeting up with some people. And then we're taking the red eye back to Boston. Full day, packed tomorrow. It's going to be a good one. Here we go. Hey everyone, this is Chris Walker, the CEO of Refine Labs. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it, feel free to like, comment, or subscribe to the channel for more videos in the future. We're also live uh, for Demand Gen Live at 7.30 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday night, which will also go on the State of Demand Gen podcast, which is available on Apple and Spotify. Thanks again and see you next time.